So this guy says, you know what? I hate my dad. You hate your ex-wife. <laughs> he just comes right out with it. He comes right out with it. <laughs> <laughs> it's so <laughs> maniacal. It's great. And it's so him. Welcome to the Old Brother Podcast. I'm your host, Dan Smith. Alongside me, as always, my brother from the same mother, Mike Smith. Just before we came on, I told you I've got I Love Lucy in my head, and I don't know why. I don't know. It's very bizarre. Didn't see it. Didn't flip past it. Maybe like maybe the era that we're going to be talking about tonight could have something to do with it, but certainly not the genre. That's for sure. No. So, uh, yeah, Mike, we're taking it back all the way back to 1951. One. Yeah. Life, life was a lot simpler back then. I should know because I wasn't alive at that point. Yeah. And neither were you. Neither was I. Neither were you. Yeah. Well, that was a different life. But this is, yeah, 1951. So we're going to talk about, uh, this is really going to be a Mike episode here. I'm going to sort of be Mike's color man <laughs> while he's doing the full commentary. But because um, I know this is a film you must know, but, uh, like the back of your hand, which is, of uh, course, Alfred Hitchcock's Strangers on a Train. Mike's holding it up if you're watching on YouTube. And it's a fantastic Blu-ray. Now, let me ask you, Blu-ray came out. 2004 like how long like many years ago right somewhere around there now that like 2001, is 2001 2004 i'm going into this um completely ignorant this was my first watch of this film oh so really i would never seen it before well i assumed you knew that but i didn't i, I it, thought you had seen it and hitchcock believe it or not is a film director that I, a filmmaker that i've not really delved that deep into me either you know like i have this um i've probably I, seen more of the alfred hitchcock presents than right. his films so like, i can't uh, even again, hold all the movies yeah he's got to do a juggling act here with yeah, 14 that's a nice, 4K. Nice box set. okay then there's this box that i have of four describe what criteria. you're holding up people can't yeah i'm holding up the, 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 the alfred hitchcock master collection or masterpiece collection That's and nice. i swapped out all the blu-rays except for one for a 4k there's 15 films in that then i have again i I'm, i use my own packaging this is like a tv show yeah what's that but called? if you it, it's alfred hitchcock the legend reigns but if you open it mm. you'll see there's four criterion yeah films from 39 steps 39 to, steps yeah lady vanishes lady yeah. vanishes yeah and we got strangers on a train yeah and this has come up in the past but and a never, few others we, we never committed to doing it so we were yeah, as, I, you know as usual we're approaching kind of record time and we're like what's right gonna, what's going to inspire us what do we want to talk about and and you're always game i know for film noir that's, that's an easy well see that's the know. thing this isn't a film noir okay maybe not, labeled it yeah not a, a classic film noir and you can right. break down why that is yeah i will um i think it has a lot of the elements but it has it would some be, elements be but interesting mostly to, black and white yeah and some of the, the, just because some a of, film's black and white, it's not a film noir. No, but some of the dialogue, some of that, you know, you dame over there, it's not as hardcore as a traditional film no. noir. But there's a little, a little taste of that. It's there's a taste much. of it. The taste of but it, it. But but if you compare it to Double Indemnity, right, by Billy Wilder, that's hardcore, full blown. Speaking of which, yeah, this was, um, well, at least the screen writer credited raymond chandler Correct. wrote double indemnity but really didn't write most of what you see on film which no on it was a woman right um, three women actually oh really one that, main woman. yeah the the main is a senzi ormond which yes you know she's brought in much later i think uh, an associate of another film director i believe that she knew or something well she was like she was novel? an assistant she was an assistant to another film director i believe oh and now see the, the reason that happens because normally hitchcock has his own team 
But this was his first film with Warner Brothers mm -hmm. under a contract with them. Right. Which and they want to use their I own all these different. Yeah. I have all these different sets because they won't agree to combine the work, which yeah, they I'm, should. I, they still can't get along. Yeah. I, I'm fascinated by that because it it brings us back to the, the studio system days. Yes. From like the early 20s, mid 20s to like around this time, like the 1950, right around there, it, it fades out mm -hmm. where you've got, especially a lot of people would know that where the, the, the talent is locked right. into long-term contracts. Right. Like a picture deal with Warner brothers. Exactly. Exactly. You know? in, in fact, this one opens right in the opening credits. It says, is it Farley Granger? That was like yes. on loan from correct. M from MGM, yes, Metro Goldwyn Mayer to Warner Brothers, as you Warner pointed Brothers. out. That's right. So and they, he put it, they put it right there. It's like, okay, we're letting you use him temporarily. Yes. And and Farley Granger had worked with Hitchcock before on the film The Rope. The Rope, yeah. Which I don't know if you've seen. I, I don't think I ever saw it. No. But it's literally one shot. Mm -hmm. It's it's shot like a play. Yeah. And that there's was no, there's no cuts. I think that was three years early. It was like 1948. You're exactly right. I think that's what it is. But yep. but yeah, I had I had uh, made a note of that about Chandler because as soon as I saw he wrote Double Indemnity, I was like, oh. But then as I read on and did some research on Stranger on a Train, again, it ends up being three women. Mm -hmm. um, this now, who did the novel? The novel was um, Patricia Highsmith. Okay, she's like the main writer. Well, the she's story. the novelist. She's the novelist. Right. She wrote the novel and she's and he, written other suspense novels. And there's quite a bit that's different from Correct. the novel to the film. In fact, just to close the loop on this uh, topic of the, of the women that were behind the writing, mm -hmm. uh, it was hitchcock's wife at the time you may recall the name of his wife at the time i can't offhand but it was I her mm -hmm. senzi ormond and then another woman i can't remember what her affiliation was but anyways they kind of collaborated right to finish it um and, and they did a treatment which is right. different from a script a, a treatment is like a movie without the script it's yeah, kind of okay. A weird That's way a, to describe way to it, but yeah, yeah. But three, interestingly, three uh, of the elements, uh, um, the major elements in the film, mm -hmm. were a result of what they wrote as part of that treatment, which was, and you can talk about when we get into the film a little bit. You'll set it up what it's about, all that. Um, yeah. I'm going to mention eyeglasses, very important to this film. Mm -hmm. All right. Mm -hmm. Um. The lighter, there's a lighter that's prominently Correct. featured in the plot here. Correct. And then a very climactic merry-go-round scene. Yes. None of that was in the book. Right. And right. that those are like three main aspects of the film. Yes. And in that that climactic scene with the you know, they didn't have that written yeah. when they started the film. Mm -hmm. The end had not been decided. They didn't know how they were going to reveal the ending. Yeah, fair to say that Hitchcock uh, was known as quite a perfectionist. Was that is that a fair statement? I think that's more than fair to say. Yeah, right. So, even when even in his own little cameos. Right. You know, which, which in this one. In this one. <laughs> I had to go back. I had right. to go back. It's 11 minutes into the film. Right. And he's stepping on a train. Correct. Carrying and what is double, he carrying? He's carrying a double base. A huge base. A huge One base. One of those, you know. Doom, yeah. doom, doom, doom. But do you know yeah. why that is? I don't. Okay, we'll come back to that. Okay. So it's it's amazing that I would shed any light on anything. Do you new. know who filmed that? Since he was I uh, no, I don't who filmed that. His Patricia. Oh, Hitchcock. his daughter. His daughter. Who is in the film, of course. Yes. Yeah. So so first, let's go ahead and, and give us a synopsis of the film. And then and then I'd like if you can talk about the elements that really don't make this a true film noir. Yeah. Well, basically, 
it, it's two guys. First of all, the I, I have to point this out before I get into it. Yeah. The opening of this film is about as good as an opening gets. Yeah. I put it above touch of evil. And you know wow. how much I love that opening. Wow, really? Okay. I put it above okay. that because he introduces these two characters mm -hmm. and not only introduces them, but elements about their life by just okay. showing their feet. So let's go back because you're going to get into the weeds of the plot and all that. Yeah. So yeah. Give the synopsis. Okay. The film noir elements. And then I want to run down the, the, the main cast and then we'll dive into it. Okay. These two strangers on a train on a train yeah. they meet on a train and one of the guy i describe as an evil john candy from planes <laughs> trains and automobiles good reference and um what's his name i'll set it up i'll set it just go yeah, ahead, go ahead. Okay, ahead so yeah so anyway they they meet and this one guy who's a bit off has this idea he knows a lot about Farley Granger in the film because he's a famous tennis player. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's rumors in the press he's about to marry a senator's daughter. Mm -hmm. But he's married and he wants out of the marriage. He wants a divorce and the wife is being tough. So this guy says, you know what? I hate my dad. You hate your <laughs> ex-wife. He just comes right out with it. He comes right out with it. Yeah. He says, why don't we agree? Like, I have a way for a perfect murder. And it's and it's all revolves around the perfect murder. How about if, like, I commit your murder and you, like, I murder your wife. And, and you, you kill you my father. My dad. There's no, there's no relationship. There's no way to tie us to these people. Yeah. We're just two strangers on a train. Now, were you but buying that? Were you buying that from the moment that that was revealed as the mo? You know the 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 the, the uh, explanation of the how they'd get away with it. Did you buy that? Um, I thought the idea was interesting that two strangers yeah, like, agree make, to kill someone because. But the perfect murder has been talked about in like how many films over the years? Well, there's right? literally and, and just a in film and just the in perfect life murder. That's right. Great uh, Michael Douglas and Gwyneth Paltrow. Gwyneth Great Paltrow. Film. Good. Great Good. film. One of my favorites, but which is not in my collection, actually. But uh, but when you hear that, like when I heard the character say that, I my my ears perked up, right? So I'm like, well, OK, mm -hmm. has Hitchcock figured out the perfect murder? Right. And, and Farley Granger's kind of chuckling the whole time, like, mm -hmm. yeah, this is great, buddy. This is a good joke. But, you know, I'm going to yeah. go to the 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 dining cart right and he can't get away from this guy it, it right. literally reminds me of the relationship of steve martin and john candy yeah where and, and he says at the beginning it's like yeah here i am yapping on and on again like you know nothing i can't stand more than a chowder box that just it would have it would have been yeah. tough to cast Candy as a tennis star, but other than that, yeah, there's a, I can see the <laughs> Well, Candy was the other guy. You know, Candy was yeah. the other guy who True. was kind of latching True. on to Farley Granger. And yeah. Farley Granger's kind of like, I'm done with you. Uh, uh, Stuart, can I get to the, you know, and he can't get yeah. away from the guy. Maybe that's how that character's uh, father made his wealth was sh shower curtain rings. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. On so trains. okay, so there's the setup. Yeah, there's the setup, and let me let me quickly run down the cast, and we talk about the film noir piece because okay, you can educate everybody on that. So of course, directed by Alfred Hitchcock. Uh, again, uh, its credit is is written by Raymond Chandler. The novel mm -hmm. I mentioned, Patricia Highsmith. Which funny note, she wasn't too pleased to find out after the fact because Hitchcock was very shrewd. Uh, mm -hmm. And he kept his name out of the negotiations to buy the rights to the novel. So he got yeah. the rights for 7,500 bucks. You know, you know what it reminds me of is Mary Poppins, Walt Disney. And, yeah. and, and, and the, the film where um, I can't even think of the name of the film. Um, it has something to do with Mary I Poppins, believe. but Tom Hanks plays Walt Disney. Oh, right. Right. I believe that 
Hitchcock's longtime editor mm-hmm. edited Mary Poppins and was nominated for an Oscar, if, if I'm not mistaken. Weird wow. connection there. But uh, so Farley Granger, you're talking about, he plays the tennis store guy, Haynes. Yes. Is the character's name. Um, Robert Walker, who we're going to talk about, I have a lot to talk about with him, uh, mm-hmm. plays Bru- the sociopath, psychopath, Bruno. Bruno Antony. Um, and Ruth Roman plays Ann Morton, who is the, you know, socialite daughter of the senator's daughter that you mentioned, right? Yes. Um, and Patricia Hitchcock, who you mentioned, uh, Hitchcock's right. daughter. I know she'd been in at least one other Hitchcock film. I can't remember what it was. She's been in several. She's been in ha- has she? many of the TV shows. Okay, right. But she, she was put- in Psycho. Do you remember oh, that's the, right. She was in she Psycho. Was, she played Caroline or something. Yeah, right. right. And and right. when the the cowboy hits on Marion Crane, she's like, "Well, he probably noticed I was married. That's why I didn't because she has a ring." Yeah, that's yeah, why yeah. you know she's, she's kind of like comic relief. Sometimes she's very definitely in this, she was very peculiar. Yes. Plays a, a character named Barbara or Babs, um, and she's yeah. also the senator's younger daughter in in the right. film. Yeah, right. right. Uh, and then lastly, I wanted to mention Casey Rogers, who plays Guy Haynes' wife. And I forget how you described her, but she's being difficult, you said. Because yeah, I called they're trying difficult. to get a divorce, and now she's right. re- reneging on that and saying, I don't want a divorce. Uh, Meanwhile, she's, she's pregnant with another, with another guy. Yeah, there's a baby. lot of themes in this. Think about it. It's 1952. Yes. Divorce was even taboo oh, of yeah. a subject. And they're talking about a woman who's pregnant with another guy's child. Very, yeah, there was a lot in this that I'm like, how did this even get made at that point? Yeah. Well, actually, a lot of people passed on it. Yeah. A lot of people passed on it. So Casey Rogers, and I just noted for those of a certain age, uh, she played Louise Tate in Bewitched, if you remember Louise in Bewitched. Oh, you're kidding me. Yeah. and Which um, is her mother, right? Right. And then yeah. she was also in Peyton Place before that for like the wow. whole run of Peyton Place. I knew so, she was well known, but I only know her from this. And I think now if you go back and watch it, you could, you'll you see that. Uh, I'd see. Definitely. It's wild. So, OK, so there is the main players. Um, and you mentioned a lot of themes, which there are a lot of themes. Mm-hmm. One that I read about that was fascinating was and you set it up by mentioning Hitchcock's cameo walking yeah. onto the train with big double bass and it's so drawn out it's so yeah yeah you know it should have taken a millisecond it, it's drawn out but right it, there's this theme of doubles that hitchcock mm-hmm. is setting up throughout yeah and the whole opening sequence you talk about the two foot the two sets of right foot, you know very different and, shoes very different shoes right and you see the tennis rackets Right. So you 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 learn about these guys before you even see their faces. Right. In fact, that was something that Hitchcock noted was he he said something to the effect that casting the right casting kind of saved his <laughs> with this film because he was able to focus a little bit more on the the filmmaking itself, the directing. Mm-hmm. because the characters, the, the actors that played these characters had a lot of these innate qualities they would bring to the performance. Yes. You know, so... It's almost like, you know, they weren't acting. It, it right. was like, this right. is pretty much who they are. Right. I love right. seeing an older... Now, Farley Granger was like a heartthrob back then. And mm-hmm. it's funny because I was watching this one time. This is n- not recently. Mom walks in and is like, is that Farley Granger? Yeah. He was he's so cute. His name like, he, he was very, very <laughs> handsome guy. Yeah, yeah. Please yeah. back away. Uh but uh he um I I the name I knew, but his yeah. filmography I wasn't as familiar with. You well, know? you probably noticed a lot of TV shows. Iron yeah, a lot of those sides, right. Uh, you know, Bonanza, he was in uh, like name it six million dollar man. You know, right. he's he was in a lot of TV, right? But you know, early on, his biggest film. This is really his biggest film. Yeah, you know, I mean, well, where do you where do you put this beside the rope? Because that preceded this. He was yes. in that. 
This is know. far better than the rope. And we should say, for those that don't know, I mean, if you're not a Hitchcock fan or, or studied of him, this film is before all of really his main masterpieces. This kicks off. It kicks off just a com- pretty a much ridiculous a string, right? Resume like a Kevin Feige, right? Original Avengers kickoff, kind of like is, that. This is Iron Man, basically. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Setting it all up. So, um, film noir. Talk a little bit about film noir here. You know, film noir, and and I I won't get it so deep into it, but the main elements usually it's in black and white, but it doesn't have to be. You know, there's right. plenty of color noirs. The Nelms Brothers, Small Town Crime, is pretty much a film noir. There you go. But it's all about an attitude and a language, which you kind of mentioned. You know, when you hear somebody say, you know, these dames are crazy. Right. And, you know, words, there's certain key words that are like, okay, this is a film noir. Right. But black and white is a big element. One of, I think I can speak for you, one of our favorite film noirs was Laura. Right. With Gene Tierney. Right. Which I think we did an episode on. Vince, Vincent Price, right? Vincent Price, mm-hmm. but Jean Tierney's the star, and there's a, a an officer. She's dead, mm-hmm. and there's an officer that's you know staying at her house trying to solve the crime, right? And he falls in love with a portrait of her, mm-hmm. and then you know things play out. She's really not dead. She walks in, and she's like, "What are you doing here?" And but but you know. One connection I want to make with that, and the, the reason I brought it up is they did a remake of Laura, the TV. Farley, Gr- yes, that's Farley right. Farley Granger's in it. I wondered if you saw. I wondered if you knew about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. I wasn't aware of that until I was kind of looking into this a little bit. So that's interesting. Do you have that? Is that something that's on disc or? I don't have it. I don't think I've seen it. But a great bonus, you know, with the that a release be. of Laura. You know, yes, the the film. Um, all right, so which, which double yeah. indemnity? Uh huh. I think I don't think the the version now Criterion just put out a fantastic 4K version, but on one of the versions there's an extra of a remake, and it's horrible. Of double about, indemnity. Oh, double indemnity. Yeah. Now, what about this disc? You held up the Blu-ray. Do you still have that? Is that? Is I got that it right nearby? here. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. does that include this this British version that uh, I read about and the American version? No, I don't think so. Okay, but you must have one I of your. Do, you don't see anything on there? It says like preview version. Yes, preview version That's is the on British this. version. I've never watched it. Yeah, there's a there right. So I didn't okay. So you might uh, Hitchcock apparently is on record didn't like either the British or the American version. I'm not sure. Really? That, yeah, I don't know exactly what that means, but that's what he, I read. From what you know, Peter Bogdanovich does a fantastic commentary and rest, he's a real yeah, he's a real Hitchcock or Seems was like a real brother. Hitchcock fan. Yeah. And in the commentary, he talks about how in love. In mm-hmm. fact, he said that Hitchcock on set called this his very first film, even though mm-hmm. he had done a ton of films. But I think he was referring to his kickoff with Warner Brothers. This was kind of a new era of Hitchcock. And really the difference here, why I wouldn't call this a noir, it's more of a suspense thriller. That's yeah. the way I see it. And a a great example, there's a scene where you mentioned a lighter being a key element of the story. It was Guy Guy Haynes' lighter. That's right. Guy Haynes. in Bruno's possession. Right. And Bruno gets bumped into, drops the lighter into a sewer. Yes. And there's a sequence that seems to go on for 20 minutes. It really does. With him reaching... Well, the lighter trying to get his hand down in the sewer grate. Right. At the same time, Guy Haynes is playing a tennis match that looked like it was going to be quick, gets into a marathon match. So 
there's this juxtaposition that Hitchcock does with the tennis match drawn out. Yeah. In the in the in the fingers, just getting to the you know what I mean? It just yeah. took so long. Yet I loved every minute. No, that was a great sequence that I, yeah. I really enjoyed. I, I felt like that was classic Hitchcock. Again, even it, though was. it was just kind of at the uh, uh, as they would say, a renaissance for Hitchcock that would, like you said, spur so many other films. Yeah. Uh, but that was a great sequence. That was a great sequence. And, you know, I just did a short. I don't know if it's come out yet. I do these shorts on TikTok. Mike's Movie Rex. Right. Of and course. I did one on four directors that hadn't received an right. Academy Award, which is stunning that two of them are on this. Uh, stunning that all four of them. And, yeah. and then there's more. But how does Stanley Kubrick not have an Oscar? I don't when know. he's done like nine films, more than that, like 11, but six of them are worthy of Academy Awards. It's just shocking to here's me. The, here's the note I was looking for. Okay. If, it, if it seemed like I wasn't I was, paying I was feeling, on yes. yeah, it's good. No, films. I was feeling, good, good yes. Films, real good films. An early preview edit of the film, sometimes labeled the British version, although it was never released in Britain or anywhere else, includes some scenes either not in or else different from the film as released. Okay. According to biographer Charlotte Chandler, Hitchcock himself did not like either the British or the American version. That's so this is what Hitchcock says. He told the biographer, apparently, that the picture, in his opinion, should have ended with Guy at the amusement park after he's been cleared of murdering his wife. He wanted the last line of the film to be mm -hmm. Guy describing Bruno as, quote, a very clever fellow. This mm -hmm. ending, however, was not acceptable to Warner Brothers. So they're then there again, right? Got the, the studio system, they're going to do what they want to do. I mean, that's what ran Orson Welles, another guy with no Academy yeah. Award, other than one I mentioned about writing, which mm -hmm. he doesn't even acknowledge. Right. Now, all of these directors got the Therm and whatever that you know honorary award is that's like an oscar only it's like a big head and i forget right. the guy's name i should know it i thought you were gonna say um, thurman munson or something yeah I, it's it's i'm it's somewhere in the thur universe but thurston howell uh, yeah somewhere thurston howell there. lovey i don't know yeah Mr. Um, Magoo. <laughs> but they all got and and it was really interesting when hitchcock got his you know, lifetime achievement award. Mm -hmm. He literally his acceptance speech. Yeah. Thank you. Of course. Thank you very much. Yeah, of course. That was it. You know, this was funny uh, because this was also back when Foley artists were like a big thing that, that yeah. Right. And you, you, I could picture at certain scenes where they're walking down the street, you know, a couple of guys off to the side, with like <laughs> those cloppers. Do, 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 yeah. you know, to make the sounds of them walking was pretty funny. Um, there's th Bruno's character. He was so over the top. Yeah. You know, this mm -hmm. character. And, and there's this kind of underlying uh, intentionally from the, 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 the writing again, I don't know. I think it might've been part of Chandler's script mm -hmm. was um, this kind of theme of, uh, homoeroticism, you know, between Guy and Bruno, you know, certainly uh, Bruno has a lot of, I would say he's to some degree an effeminate character. Yeah. Like a um, mama's boy. I think you would call like a mama's boy. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Cause and, the and when you meet his mother, <laughs> you can tell that the, 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 the acorn hasn't fallen far from the tree. No, she was a real she's a little whacked out goofball. You know, what's interesting in that same scene you're talking about right there. Mm -hmm. When we first meet his mother, uh, he's in like a smoking jacket or robe <laughs> or something. It's very yeah. odd, but yeah. And having a little too intimate of a conversation with his mother, I feel, but yeah, but he, we see his father come in late in that scene, which I mm -hmm. think is the only time we see his father in the that's whole picture. It. Yeah. That's it. And when, there's a there's a shot where the the father and the mother are in the background, mm -hmm. and Bruno is in the foreground, right? Mm -hmm. The way the way that Hitchcock has it set up, 
Mm -hmm. And you can hear it goes back and forth between Bruno on the phone with Guy Haynes. Right. Right. And then to the mother and the father and back having a, a separate conversation. And they're talking about Bruno. Right. And he's this, you know, up and all this. He gets into all these different things. And at one point, the dad says, you know, we need to talk as he's walking by Bruno. He's like, sorry, dad, long distance call. And he gets on the phone. He's talking to guy. Right. Meanwhile, the dad's talking to the mom and says, it's a hit and run this time. Mm. I don't know if you pick up on that. I, I apparently this really happened to the actor um, Robert Walker. He His got life, into a hit and run. He, well, he got into a lot more than that. He really. I don't know if you know this. He died at thirty-two. Whoa! The same year this film came out, nineteen fifty-one. I had no idea. He, what I knew about him was he never played a heavy, or he never played a bad guy. He always played a good guy. Now, interesting mm. because mm. his son is mm -hmm. on the disc okay. and like the making of feature. Yes. And I think his son, did he, did he, didn't he go into acting as well? I don't know, but he looks exactly like him when it, when he came on screen, he, you know, yeah. he, he's older yeah. and he had kind of white hair and I'm like, Oh, that's, and then it says junior. And I realize. Mm -hmm. He's talking about his dad. Right. And I'm like, I mean. Now, you you can you can read all about his life online. Um, yeah. But it was very troubled. He got into a lot. I think it seems like it may have started when his parents divorced when he was young. And he never really recovered from that. He would eventually become a very heavy drinker. And it, it's it's incredible when you read. I had no idea so about that. Which I'm was shocked. He was drinking. I think he was home. He's in this agitated state. Yeah. And a doctor. This comes. is real life. This is real life. Yeah. A doctor comes and in an attempt to calm him down, gives him a sedative. Well, he'd been drinking. The two don't mix. No. And he ends up basically having a heart attack and dies. Wow. And he was on a pretty good trajectory despite these issues in his personal life. You know, he was gaining favor in Hollywood at the time. Yeah. And yeah. so um, you'll have to read about it. It's fascinating. I, I have to. I'm, they, I'm if so there's not a documentary, that. there should be on this guy's yeah. life. It's fascinating. It's fascinating. And so you can kind of see some of that playing out on screen in his character. Yeah. Very kind of, again, sociopath, you know? Right, right. So, um, I got to talk about a couple of scenes yeah. that are so well directed. It's like, this is directing. Like, if I yeah. was teaching a film class, I would show these scenes. Yeah. One, we talk, you know, the opening is just to me a work of art. It's just it's so done. Yeah. And, and you see these feet walking, and it all culminates in their accidentally bumping feet. And that's how, you know, then Hitchcock brings it up, and we see these two characters that he's already introduced. So right. that sequence, then there's the sequence in the tunnel of love, mm -hmm. which is, you know, one of the main reasons that this is in black and white was for that sequence, because, you know, the way Hitchcock uses shadows and then coming out of that sequence, there's the glasses. Yes. Like the whole time when I, when I meet the wife, you know, from the Miriam. time they, yeah. Miriam, when I meet her, she's kind of mousy looking and these glasses don't help. Now, you know, she had perfect vision, the actress. Yeah. And he insisted that she wear these glasses and they were these really thick. Yes. Glasses. Coke bottle kind of glasses. Yeah. To the point where she needed help getting around the set. Yeah. Because she couldn't yeah. see. Anything. Right. Right. But there's a shot where i guess we're going to give this spoiler <laughs> well no i don't think it's it, no because well i already already gave away the ending of the film but um it's important because this is something that's studied in in film school today the sequence right. that you're about to talk about in fact i read about i read kind of what went into it and i'm still like 
how did he do that? Like, it's, right. so, it's so crazy at that time, too, if you think about it. Right. So Bruno just goes ahead and, and in his head, they made an agreement to kill, do each other's crisscross. Oh, yeah. Crisscross. I love that. You you kill my father, I kill your wife. The old crisscross. Right. Yeah. So we see Bruno carry out the murder. Mm hmm. But instead of showing it head on, Hitchcock films it from the point of view of the glasses. Right. So he's there's this brief struggle. Yeah. As he puts his hands around her throat, the glasses mm -hmm. hit the ground. Right. And now you're seeing the whole murder play out in the glasses. Yeah. Which it's a is, fantastic shot. You got to see it to really appreciate it. It's, a, it's pretty phenomenal. And then the other shot that I would say needs to be in every film class is the tennis match or mm -hmm. i think he was practicing i don't think it was the match okay. but you know how if you've ever watched tennis it's oh yeah oh i'm glad you brought this up uh, go ahead and yeah because i got a comment so on it too. you got all these heads moving with the ball right which if you watch tennis and yeah, you that's stop and look at the crowd that's what it looks what like it yeah. except for bruno staring down farley granger you know See, I, I found that to be very goofy really i i, I love I, that shot i, I don't but it. i don't i don't think it was pulled off effectively enough because i i i almost wanted to chuckle because it's so all the other actors are so obliquely yeah, they're craning you know, their neck yeah <laughs> it's so yeah. ridiculous it's 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 great in in theory you know the concept right. is great I'm not sure that the uh, the uh, delivery, the implementation, was maybe as good not. As it you know, been. I think somebody stole that shot because I uh, think it's in another film. Yeah, but I can never come up with the film. Was that the last one? You had another one that you mentioned. Was that the last one you mentioned? Uh, that was the you last mentioned? one. Yeah. Okay, so there's another one that I loved. I'm surprised yeah. you didn't mention. It's a little more subtle. Yeah, because you mentioned, you know, I said the theme of doubles was big throughout Correct. this film. Lots of other themes. Um, but sh shadows and light, of course, too. Mm -hmm. And not just in this Hitchcock film, but but there's a sequence where uh, Bruno is returning back to the, uh, what is it again? A carnival. The carnival right, grounds, right. right? And he's standing in line to kind of inch closer to where the scene of the crime took place. He's kind of going to revisit the scene of the crime. Yeah. Is it know. like a popcorn line or you would Yeah, some sort spot. of concession line or, yeah. or, or yeah. near the boat dock where you get the boats for the tunnel of love or something. Tunnel of love. Right. And the, and the boat operator kind of look and spots him in the line. Right. And the whole time he's got his fedora. He's trying to kind of keep it low. Bruno, you know, trying to correct conceal himself. And he's, He's on this walkway, and then all of a sudden, he just takes a slight step forward, and his face gets illuminated by the by the light. Yeah, by the moon. And that's when the guy kind of thinks he recognizes him, and, and then goes he quickly to the cops. steps he steps back into the shadows. Correct. It was so subtle, but just beautifully done. Beautifully Great done. shot. Great yeah, shot. Just yeah, so it's a good so good one nice. to point out. You met. We mentioned the cameo, of course, <laughs> because I had to go back to find it. Oh, you didn't. I, I think Catch I must first have, time? I, I must have put my head down for two seconds. And yeah, I it. it goes by quick. Because I went back and then immediately I just started laughing because there he was. You know? Yeah, but and, it's, and um, for those who don't know Hitchcock, yeah. he's known for. In fact, this, in Psycho, yeah. I just watched Gus Van. I don't know why it's so weird. I watched Gus Van Zant's version of Psycho, the shot by shot remake. Oh, okay. Yeah, which really isn't that. shot by shot, but right. Right. That's another another show. Um, there's a sequence where this guy comes into the bank where Marion works, and Hitchcock is out, is just standing in front of the. All you see is his back. Yeah. And in the shot by shot remake, sure enough, Gus Van Zant dressed up like Hitchcock. That's funny. And does the camera. So Hitchcock's known for doing these very brief one to three second cameos in every one of his films. And I no, always I, like you, I look for it. Has he been, has it been in every no. single? Okay. No. And, and it wasn't like 
consecutive like there was like he was in three and then he wasn't in one and then he'd reappear you know i don't know the hit i just know he wasn't in every one in every one of them okay yeah okay just curious yeah um and some of the sets too you know some's on location some was like the tennis match you mentioned not mm -hmm. the practice but the actual tennis match some of that like they went and literally filmed the actual tennis tournament in dc or something and he used that from from for the um the the far away shots yeah it's not you can really, see the pentagon or yeah or, you know well, it's not really the actors playing tennis it is when they're close up yeah but not in the wide shot and did you did you recognize the actor the other tennis player i didn't who He's was from that? mash he was a guy from mash that played oh. trapper john oh sure Oh, yeah. I didn't pick up on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. A little, yeah, little yeah. younger version, but younger yeah. version, much younger. So, so this is a you know, and this is a, a. It's only an hour and forty minutes. It's like easily consumed. Oh, by the right. way, for those that are interested in seeing it, I'd recommend you see it. Mm -hmm. um, I saw it free on Tubi. Okay, good. So I saw that you know. had to rent it on Amazon, but I did notice it free. Yeah, on you, Tubi you, and now. There's only and there's, what, there's commercials, but there's a couple just brief, you know, nothing major. And, and I highly recommend the disc. I, yeah. I hope it comes in a 4K now, soon. Now, what's the cover image on that? Oh, I see. It's the two of them embracing. Exactly. The, the, the senator's daughter and Farley yeah. Granger. You know, I always confuse this with The Stranger by Orson Welles, which is one of my favorite Welles, lesser known Welles films, I would say. Yeah. Right. Yep. But, uh, you know, Stranger on Train, The Stranger, just always mash those up. But anything That's like else? The Killing, The Killers. Right. The Killing Joe, Both. Killers of the Flower yeah. Moon, you know. Yeah. Uh, oh, one, one last thing about Bruno's um, hey, that be, character. Well, while you just, before, I, I want to get to that, but before... Yeah. I, I there was somebody online that was talking about how you know he picked Oppenheimer to win the Oscar, which you know that's a tough call. Right. And I made a comment, I said, you know, I really think Killers of the Flower Moon was a lot right. closer to you know giving that a run, yeah. And he wrote back and said, That's not even in my top 20 from this year. Oh. I'm like, okay, if that's not your top 20, I don't know why I'm watching you. Right. I mean, yeah. Okay. I, I get it didn't win, but yeah, it was different strokes, different strokes, di right? Different right. strokes, you know, um, because, but you know, there's going to be people that aren't going to agree with, and, and there are many have told us so that they don't <laughs> yeah. agree with what we say. Uh, but there was one funny thing about the character. Cause again, he's such a sociopath. He's at the carnival. The first mm -hmm. sequence where he arrives at the carnival before he's going to commit this murder. Then he's mm -hmm. smoking a cigarette, as you often did back then on film. That's and, another noir element. Right. And this this little kid walks by with a balloon and kind of right. bang bangs him or something with a fake gun or something. And as the kid's passing by, Bruno turns around and just pops the balloon with the cigarette. <laughs> <laughs> it's so maniacal. It's great. And it's so him. It's yeah. so that character. I think, and the, the, you know, Chris doubles... You mentioned yeah. about doubles. Yeah. And Patricia Hitchcock doubled mm -hmm. for uh, the actress that played Miriam a couple of times. Like, oh, it was okay. a sequence that. that they didn't really use. It's probably in that alternate mm -hmm. version where. Pick up shot or something they used. Her. Yeah. She's on the Ferris wheel. Yeah. And, you know, it's it's actually Patricia. It's not the actress oh, that's interesting yeah. so and yeah. there, there's a few others you know like and you mentioned doubles again you know like bruno when he sees patricia he sees miriam mm -hmm. and he kind of goes into this weird trance yeah yeah when, yeah, he, when very, he's looking at her very prominent theme throughout the whole film yeah uh, yeah it makes me want to want to start to dive into Hitchcock more with, with the other classic films that, that I haven't seen, you know, bits right. and pieces, but really haven't and sat and, and watched them. You and I went to Universal Studios when they had a Hitchcock exhibit. It's Remember, somebody you mentioned that, because wasn't that also where the Foley artist experience was at Universal? Yeah, I think so. You'd go in and so. they'd play, and then they, you'd go up and they'd give you a pair of shoes and you could do the, right. oh, the horse galloping or something. And they re... You know, they would take somebody from the audience and dress them up 
as right. Norman Bates dressed up as his mother, right. and they would shoot the so the shower scene. Yeah. But there was also like this area where they would show how he did certain effects. Like, I don't know which film. I think it was um it, not frenzy, but um oh vertigo. Vertigo. Uh, how how did I know? You know, stall on yeah. that. But Mike, I, Mike had a little vertigo there. For yeah, a second. vertigo. You know, the climax is a guy falling from the Statue of Liberty, and if you remember that exhibit, they showed how Hitchcock did it because people wondered: Did you know? Was it on a string? Was he wired? Mm -hmm. No. Instead of the guy falling, the top of the um, pull the camera up. Yeah, the camera went up. He mm -hmm. didn't, he never, and he was just going like this. Right, right. But it looks like the guy's falling. I mean, it's incredible yeah. back then how they. Yeah. And, and that's effect. why, that's why when you see practical effects today, it's, it's, uh, I, I have such an appreciation for that. Like, like we talked about with Nolan and Oppenheimer. That's a great example right, right there, you know? Right. So, well, listen, uh, you probably never thought, first of all, here we are doing, uh, one of your favorite, uh, films, but yeah. Uh, also, you probably never thought you would have learned a new tidbit about this film from me. No, of all more people. Than one more yeah. than one. Yeah. So, so there you go. Anything else to leave the audience with? On no, Mastery? I just like yeah. this is such a good movie, and yeah. you know Hitchcock has a bunch of them. Yeah, it, I, I really if I if if I'm gonna tell you to watch one Hitchcock movie, uh -huh. I'm probably gonna pick Strangers on the Train. Now, we just got uh, uh, saw in the headlines today, I mentioned this to you, that M. Emmett Walsh uh, passed Awful. away. Great, 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 great actor. Was he in a, any Hitchcock films? Because he, he goes back. I don't think so. I think he was about 90 or so, I think. But uh, Yeah. I don't think great, he goes uh, back that far. <laughs> he was, wasn't he in Fletch? Yes, he was. He played the doctor. <laughs> That's you right. know he was the one Moon River <laughs> was it yeah right. <laughs> that was that was yeah. M.M. Walsh he was in a great so movie Coen Brothers movie oh my god funny um a very early film Blood their Simple. first film Blood Simple Blood Simple yeah and M.M. M. M. Walsh is is fantastic in that but yeah. he's he could do it all he was in the Jerk he yes. was the guy shooting at Steve Martin when he was yeah he's like these cans that guy's shooting these cans he <laughs> hates these cans <laughs> a great actor rest in peace M. M. yeah Walsh. missed well listen there you go there's uh strange on a train from alfred hitchcock did you did you enjoy it i, I mean, did yeah there was yeah. again a few moments that it kind of i kind of you know smirked a little bit it was a little yeah. silly but no, I appreciate the film quite a bit. I, I I enjoyed it. It was nice. It was, and it's nice to go back and see one of those classics and right. check that off. I, my I list, remember, you know. you know, I had to twist your arm to get you to watch Laura. Yeah, that's and, great. Laura's and, great. And it's such a good film. And Gene Tierney, one. who had a very troubled life. Yeah. Um. Go go she, read about Robert Walker. I'm telling you. Yeah, I I uh, will. And and and. Gene Tierney was actually uh, with JFK for a while. And mm. if she was Catholic, he would have married her. Mm. But there you go. Oh, uh, well, you, last thing I made a note. I just happened to notice. I didn't mention it was just a minor thing to make me chuckle was because it made me think of Curb Your Enthusiasm, which was Ruth uh, Roman, who played um, the senator's daughter um, mm -hmm. and and Morton. Right. Uh she Hitchcock did not want her really. And they did not get along. Now, you know, about Hitchcock and his relationship to certain women on his film sets. Oh well, yeah. It's, it's, it's legendary. Yes. Yeah. And, and Farley Granger even commented on the same experience that he observed on when they were making the rope. No, it's a very thumbs down. Folks, thumbs down. Yeah. This topic. But, uh, but it, it was stated as uh, that uh, Ruth Roman was foisted onto Hitchcock, which if you again, remember the episode, uh, foisted was curb your enthusiasm where, right. The daughter uh, of somebody, it was the assistant, wasn't it? An assistant that gets foisted from like Jimmy Kimmel. Onto oh, Larry that's right. That's something. right. And, 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 and they make all, you foisted her on me. You Leon's foisted like, her. Yeah. He foisted that. 
It's a voice <laughs> job. It's a voice job. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That would be exactly. the um, Oh, boy. Oh, there was one other thing when when you had said that. No, we were on a roll there. Just, we have to tighten this yeah, up. Just, yeah, I know. We just went off a just, cliff. We were going to close. Went off a cliff. And then we just kind of sunk. You, so. you lost your train of thought. I don't know what you yeah. were talking about. Was it, was it when I was talking about his uh, treatment? Oh, of, women. Yeah. Yeah. If it was up to Hitchcock, Grace Kelly would be his leading lady in every film. Well, it's interesting because it's International Women's History Month, too, we should say. So it's yeah. kind of appropriate to to be commenting on it. But, right. uh, yeah, it was a different time then. Um, yeah. And sadly, and, and it, you know, that she, stuff still goes on today. But Yeah, and, and Grace Kelly, who, you know, loved Hitchcock, but, you know, I, I think it was taking up too much of her time. She was the Princess of Monaco. Mm -hmm. And I... I've seen the letter. I don't know. It was in an extra on a DVD that she wrote to him mm -hmm. saying I can no longer. So Tippi Hedren, who wound up starring in the birds and mm -hmm. a couple of other hitch films was kind of like she foisted. A... Yeah, foisted. Yeah. Yeah. So. All right. Well, we got to get the foist out of here. Yeah. Uh, nothing else to say about strange on a train. I think that a uh, pretty good dive into strange on a train. Yeah. Yeah, deep yeah. dive into strangers. And... We'll be back with some more Hitchcock. That was enjoyable. So uh, yeah, there, yeah, there you go. Yeah, Strange on a Train. And um, if you're not currently following us, make sure that you do. Go out to the uh, Old Brother website, ohbpodcast.com, at, uh, at ohbpodcast on Instagram, uh, at Old Brother Podcast on TikTok, wherever, where. Same thing on YouTube, too, at mm -hmm. Old Brother Podcast. That's our handle on YouTube. Um, so if and if you don't already... see the logo, like the red if you, yeah, if you don't see over there wherever it is yeah it's not it's the real not old true, brother. but but go out subscribe to the the uh the youtube channel like our videos help us get the the show out to more and more people thank you to all of you that have continued to do that mm -hmm. um been very very appreciative we've you know continue to see those numbers go up so we we appreciate that like i said just uh, helps get the show out to more and more people but that's gonna do it for another episode of the one and only Old Brother Podcast. I've been your host, Dan Smith. Long time me as always, my brother from the same mother, Mike Smith. And we will see you next time. Bye, everyone.